road courses if you want to be good and give yourself a chance. Can he hang on to it? No, he's going to go around. Hold on to it. Hold on to it. Hold on to it. These road courses are a great place to lose a lot of points. Locks up the wheels and slides. Now the leader turns around. The gloves are off. It's full contact racing. Pushing him up out of the groove, making the pass. Alma Digger is wearing out the points leader. Finally, yes! Yes! Xfinity Series always putting on a great show on road courses. They're no strangers to the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, but this is different this year because it's the road course inside the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. And thank you for joining us. We're very excited about being back and calling racing and even practice. This is the first practice that the Xfinity Series has been able to do since the COVID uh, pandemic. And because of the COVID protocol, we actually are at Charlotte Motor Speedway. And we want to thank them for allowing us to be up here in the booth to call these races. Uh, drivers, we've seen one practice so far. What did you think of that first practice at Indy? Well, it was exciting, just like we expected. A lot of guys really learning this track uh, and having a hard time with it. Uh, just take a look here at Ryan Seed. He was, he's going to be in some of this action from the first practice, having a lot of issues. He ended up to practice seven or almost seven seconds down from fast time. He's got a lot to learn here, uh, Jeff. Yeah, one thing we have seen about this track, though, it's a little bit forgiving. See Brandon Jones flying into turn one, trying to find his breaking zone. Michael Annette, see a lot of people miss that corner. Jeb Burton. Got the lights of the right front locked up. We saw a lot of right front lock up and then a little lazy spin. But again, no damage. A lot of grass, a lot of place for these guys to go. Jeremy Clemens making good time and afraid this car is going to roll over. That thing has got Ray hiked up, hiked up. Okay, Steve, now we saw Jeremy Clemens' car. That's not the proper way to go around a racetrack, right? No, you're hoping your car looks a little bit in better condition handling wise and it stays on the asphalt a little bit better but i think really the big thing for me is i'm looking at this second practice as an opportunity to check off some other things fuel mileage these crew chiefs have no idea how many laps they can run on a tank of fuel maybe tire wear can you make this race on just one pit stop two sets of tires there's a lot of you know fundamental things that you understand about race tracks and different facilities that these crew chiefs have no idea about heading here to a brand new road course in indianapolis or brand new for the xfinity series always love the strategy that you bring to every broadcast steve and one new thing that has taken place is well not one new thing but a lot of new things because of one man roger penske uh, now owns the indianapolis motor speedway and for more on all of that let's bring in rutledge wood Oh, Rick, it's so great to be here with you. You know what? Roger Penske does things first class, and he wanted to make sure that in his stewardship of the Indianapolis Motor Speedway that fans knew they were the most important thing. Take a look at some of the improvements that have been made, all focused on the fans, getting them back here. But number one, it's all about making sure everything they see, they feel, they touch is better for them. So whether it's the brand new entrances, how people really get in and out of the track, the flow of it, the way that the cameras are set up for to make sure that fans get the best view. There's video screens everywhere. Here in front of the Pagoda, there's a huge video screen, 100 feet by 20 feet tall, so that fans can really enjoy everything about it. And Roger Pinsky stopped by and said hello a few minutes ago, and he asked me, oh, what'd you think? And I looked around like, uh, Roger Pinsky, are you asking me what I think? I think it looks fantastic. But everything they tried to do from the new bathrooms to the landscaping was really all about keeping the history of this amazing track, but making it better for all the fans. And Marty, what a historic weekend it is here at Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Yeah, right. we have IndyCar, we have Xfinity Series, and we have the NASCAR Cup Series here this weekend. So yeah, you're right, a historic weekend here at Indianapolis. And you know, it's funny, just about maybe 100 feet behind pit road where the Xfinity cars roll out on the racetrack, this is the IndyCar paddock. There's Joseph Newgarden, the 2019 champion. There's his car. They have qualifying here for the IndyCar series in a moment. That's coming up on NBCSN at 4 p.m. Eastern. And right beside him, Will Power. You know, I asked Chase Briscoe, Xfinity Series winner last week, a moment ago, I said, hey, would you want to run an IndyCar? He said, around the road course, not around the oval. I'm not worked up to that yet, but I asked the team Penske drivers yesterday, if Tim Sendrick walked in and said, hey, we have an Xfinity Series seat open, would you guys take it? 
First one to raise his hand, Joseph Newgarden in the foreground there. And Will Power said, wait a minute, bud, seniority. I've been asking for years if I could get in an Xfinity Series car. They told me that, you know what, I have to win an Indy 500 and win a championship. I won both of those, and they still haven't talked to me about it. I'm hoping someday they do talk to me about it. But you know what, Jeff Burton, Will Power told me if I could run any Xfinity Series race, I would run Bristol. Not a road course, Bristol. That's what Will Power wants to hop into. He's crazy. <laughs> He's not the, you know, those guys aren't the only ones that want that opportunity to run an Xfinity Series. Uh, talk to Marco Andretti, uh, Ray Hall. There's several drivers that would love the opportunity to get behind the wheel of one of these cars. If you're a race car driver, you're always curious to, as to what other kind of cars, how they handle and how they drive and race. i tell you something, too. You think about Team Penske, right? They're the only team that could sweep all three races. They could win all three races this weekend. That would be an extremely historic moment for that organization. Yeah, big for the organization, obviously, because of uh, the transition or the transaction that's taken place from the Holman family to the Penske family. But how about the start to the 2020 season for the 20 of Harrison Burton, who, by the way, isn't 20 yet. He's only 19, so we can't complete that cycle of 20. Steve, he's had a phenomenal beginning to this season. Yeah, 10 straight top 10 finishes to start his rookie campaign in the Xfinity Series, setting a record. He's had a little bit of a misstep, not really of his own doing, but Pocono and Talladega kind of got away from him. But the beauty is with those two wins, now Harrison knows he is in the playoffs. And I think that helps when you talk about a 19-year-old race car driver taking the pressure of potentially being in the playoffs off his, you know, off his chart allows him, I think, Kelly, to just work on getting better, to enjoy driving this 20 car, to try to win some more races, to be a race car driver, to have fun. Having fun is what it's all about. You talked at the top of the show, Steve, about what some of these crew chiefs might be taking advantage of in this second practice looking at things like fuel mileage and tire wear. It sounds like that's just the plan here for Harrison. His crew chief told them you're going to make a little bit longer run, about an eight-lap run or so, to manage uh, to look at just those things. I also heard Jeb Burton being instructed uh, that he wants to run a full-speed pit road practice. So pit road is going to be another crucial thing, and this one can be a little bit tricky. Remember, it's going to be backwards for these guys, right? Yeah, I'm not watching this practice. Harrison ended the first practice 13. We're going to watch him and the rest of the field and see where they net out at the end of second practice. How much have they learned? How much have they picked up in time and speed? It's really hard after that first practice understanding who's competitive, who's going to be playing a role in this race. I like the crew chief's plan, though. Eight lap run. I would imagine, Dale, although you know what? One thing that we need to talk about, the 20 right there, jumps that curb in that combination of corners. He's going to try to do the same thing here in turn seven. One thing I want to keep in mind is to the driver's left here in turn seven. There's a set of rumble strips and curbs just like there is in the five and six turn complex. The NASCAR has said that they're going to add turtles, which became famous at the Roval, these big obtrusive curbs. So see right here, you see the red, or excuse me, the white, light blue, and dark blue curbing. Well, above that, that strip of concrete right there inside the curb, that will be a turtle. That will prevent drivers from shortcutting that corner. If you put your left tires to the inside of that curb tomorrow when that turtle's there, disaster. Same thing here, Junior. Look here. So this is five and six. They, these guys, as, as Noah goes through there, he does not shortcut six, but I've seen guys uh, Riley cut that corner in the 18 car, and you can see the marks over there where that gray stripe is. That's where the turtles are supposed to be for the race, and a lot of guys are cutting that right now. Won't be able to cut that in the race. It's going to be interesting to see them have to make that adjustment. Yeah, that's going to be a gift you don't want to receive when you drive over there like you did in practice, and now there's this big steel. And the reason it's not in there, to be clear, NASCAR, like right there, <laughs> where that car just went, that's not going to be an option. It's not there because they cannot be there for the Indy cars. If the Indy car goes straight through there, it already does enough damage to an Indy car. So these are the compromises that had to be discussed. Two different series running the same racetrack. So, so right there. You might want to text Harrison. Harrison, yeah, Harrison would, have, would have hit the turtles running, running it like that, and he'll have to make that adjustment. Oh, yeah, there they are. We're waiting for you. They're coming out. They're going to be bolted down. That's going to be interesting because a lot of those guys are going to have to learn the morning of the race, where those curbs are, and go, oh man, now I've got to learn the track again. Now I can't, cha I can't cha uh, challenge those corners the same way. 
Man, it's going to take a lot of adjustment. I don't envy those guys. And I know you're at home saying, well, why are they running there? You know, why, why would they, like right there, you just saw Riley run through it. Why are you doing that? Because everybody wants to win everything, right? It's practice, and you want to win every single opportunity you get. Now, although you really need to consider what are you going to have to do tomorrow? And, and put those turtles up. You may as well make that adjustment right now today. All right, so why are they not up now? Because today, both Xfinity and IndyCar are on track. There you go. Look at just this right here. Look how low and sleek that IndyCar is. Look how much gap there is underneath that Xfinity car. This Xfinity car, heavy, lots of power, but also lots of travel. It can kind of go over the curbing, so you got to put that turtle there to protect from it. That sleek-looking IndyCar, let me tell you, that curbing, you don't want to touch it. That's enough, right, Dale Jr.? Like, you do not want to hit that curbing with that IndyCar. There it is. Two beautiful machines, thanks to Team Penske and Menards for doing that, putting those up there. One 1,700 pounds, one over 3,400 pounds. It's amazing. And how about this? Fastest in practice. Look at that. 30 miles an hour faster on average around the road course. This set of corners right here, turn five and six. That's the most important for me. I mean, we're all learning as we go, but right now this is a really critical part of the racetrack because it leads on that long straightaway down into turn seven. You make a mistake here, you're going to get passed down this straightaway, put yourself in a position to be passing the braking zone of seven. Chastain learning a little bit from his veteran teammate, AJ Allmendinger, as they go down into turn seven, turn eight. You think this is by design? I do. This is off the bumper cam of Allmendinger Charge. We go through this little session of corners. Turn 11 here coming up to Sloan Sweeper. Listen to the throttle. Can't run wide open through there. Hard breaking into 12. Turn 13, if you want to pit, you exit right there on the right. This, this is going to be really important. You know, to be in the throttle really early here, long, because look what it leads to. Front straight away, long front straight away. If you don't get off that turn 14 corner, you're going to be in trouble, because this is going to be the passing zone. I bet you'll see more passes right here than anywhere else throughout the day. We saw 169 miles an hour there, and they'll get down to about 50. I wonder how challenging it is as you're braking in that darker pavement into turn one, but in turn seven, it's the older surface of the in interior road course. Maybe it's a bit bit different of a braking zone, a deeper, or more shallow braking zone. This is the area right here, right there. That's where we were showing those turtles where they're going to be put. I think, guys, I think one of the things you'll see these drivers doing is I think if you hit that curb just right with the right side tires, you might can jump over the turtles. If you use too much of it, you're going to just destroy your car. But I think you'll better sync it up and get those right side tires over. Marty. And Jeff, if you were Ross Chastain and road course racing wasn't exactly your thing and you had a teammate like A.J. Allmendinger, wouldn't you take him up on his offer to follow him around the racetrack? It's exactly what's going on with these two guys right now. It is by design. A.J. trying to show Ross around the racetrack a little bit. I talked to A.J. earlier this morning about starting 30th tomorrow. Yes, he has to start 30th because, again, this team does not run full time, so they have to draw, and they get a draw on the very back of the pack. So AJ will start 30th tomorrow. He said it's going to be fun. That's what he's going to enjoy is coming up through the field tomorrow. And he's already got one win this year, right, guys? Always we have Anthony Alfredo off the course. Uh, AJ already has one win this year. Finally got that win on an oval. That was Atlanta earlier this year, and here he is winning on the oval finally, Rick. Yeah, in Atlanta, such a big day for A.J. Allmendinger. Got the win, and his, his biggest celebration was the fact that he won on an oval. He had multiple wins in his career in multiple different disciplines. Yeah. yeah, his racing resume on the road courses is amazing, from Champ Car to Cup to Xfinity to IMSA. But you can see the excitement because of that oval. You heard Marty talk about starting lineup, so it's a random draw in groups of 12 by owner points. So basically, if you're in the top 12, you pick within that 12. You can finish anywhere first to 12th or start anywhere first to 12th. And then 13th in the middle group and so on. So no real qualifying. We saw the right rear down for Anthony Alfredo. Take a look. Well, it's flat going into the turn seven there. I wonder how he cuts that down. Surprise me, I don't see any damage. 
We had a flat tire also on 02 in the first practice on the left rear. Let's listen into their radio. Yeah, my bad there, the right rear. It felt like it was locking up, so I thought it was drivetrain's issue. You see, thought it was a drivetrain issue, ended up being a flat tire. It's a crew chief. I'd much rather have a flat tire. That's a lot easier to fix. Just hope it's not doing any damage while it drives in here. You see no inner liners run. So the car's all the way down on the wheel. There's that bright yellow 22. You know, Rick, I love when one of the favorites picks a paint scheme that bright. It's going to be <laughs> easy to pick out on the TV screen. Always love that Menards color, but that one's going to be easy to pick out tomorrow because I think you're going to see it near the front of the pack most of the day. There's quite a few drivers that are 21 years old in this field, and one of them is Austin Sindrick, just 21 years old and already success. And we see Mike Wallace, maybe a bit over 21 from St. Louis, Missouri. Kelly. 61 years old, in fact, for Mike Wallace, who was making his return to NASCAR for the first time since 2015. But that paint scheme, not just a cool patriotic scheme uh, for the 4th of July, but really it's to feature the U.S. Marine Corps veteran Danny Garcia and his Honor Walk 2020. This is a four month long initiative to raise funds for America Salutes You, which really benefits veterans, first responders, and active military members. And the 75-year-old Vietnam War veteran, former law enforcement officer and ordained minister, has been walking for charity since 1996. He's taken more than 52 million steps on six different continents. He walks anywhere from 25 to 50 miles a day. He's going to start this uh, this coming weekend. And he'll be walking, guys, get this, until October 29th when it ends at the Grand Ole Opry for an America Salutes You benefit concert. So it's all in the name of raising money for those uh, heroes, our veterans, our active military members, and our first responders. So a cool initiative here for Mike Wallace and his team. That's great, Kelly. Again, 25 miles, uh, pretty much a minimum of 25 miles a day. Here's uh, Myatt Snyder making his way out onto the track. I think he's happy to be on the track. Plagued with mechanical issues in the first practice. Not a lot of laps. Oh, it looks like the 08 Joe Graff Jr. has stalled his first Xfinity Series start. I can't quite figure out the set of corners. Oh, that's going into turn one. Just got the wheel hopping in the braking zone. Going to see a lot of that. So wheel hopping, let's talk about weekend, that, right? So wheel hopping is basically, it can be driven by brakes or it can be driven by the drive line. You see that left rear tire, if we see that replay again, watch the left rear tire literally hop, skip, and bounce across the pavement. Mechanically, I understand what's going on from a driver's seat, though, Junior. I mean, there's not a lot you can do once that tire starts hopping, is there? Yeah, the best thing you can do is to knock it out of gear and just try not to get on the brake pedal too hard and allow that tire to stop hopping. The, the, you've gotten down into the braking zone so deep and the revs are so high on the engine it begins to hop the tire. And to knock it out of gear is the quickest way to stop it. But you're going to miss the corner, so prepare for that as well. That's a good thing about that turn one is there's plenty of area, you know, if you, to miss the corner. Actually, at Watkins Glen, I started, I would just almost stab the throttle, like just go full throttle just for a second it would get it to stop, but you would miss the corner. But it was better than backing it in. Yeah, I was going to say, so no matter what, you're going to miss the corner. Yeah. Well, we were talking about Myatt Snyder before we had that action. Uh, Myatt needed some laps. He had mechanical issues in the first practice. We're getting all kinds of reports of different issues they had to work through. And he's battling to try to make the playoffs, but to do it with a couple different teams. He runs the 21 that Anthony Alfredo is in this weekend for RCR. Now he's also driving this 93 in other uh, races for RSS Racing. So by it, trying to work a little different double duty, right? Two different race teams over the course of the season. Currently just above that cut line, 12th in points. We'll see if he can pull it off. He's had some good runs this year. I talked to Maya the other day, and he said it's very interesting for him getting out of one car and into the other. You know, Richard Childress's car is, you know, expected to be in the front, and this team's trying to build to where they can get that. And he has to change his expectation level when he gets into each of them. But he says both opportunities are great because there's way less pressure in this car, right? He can go out and really work on himself and, and try to make the team better, but also just really work on himself and pay attention to 
the small things, just do all the little things right to get the very best finish he can with this team. But change your expectations based on each car you're driving. That would be that would be a unique situation. Let's listen, listen into their radio. Basically, it's a little snug in the center right now, um, but the transitioning, the transitioning from left to right, you know, kind of where the front would bounce before, is a lot less now. Um, so if we can work with how the platform is right now and get it to rotate the center a little bit faster, I think we'll be pretty good. Oh, I love that feedback. That's great feedback for a crew chief. That gives me a specific task at hand. I know what I need to work on. When he talks about platform, we showed earlier the 51 of Clements with the tires up off the ground. What Myatt's saying right there is he likes kind of the attitude of the platform of his car. Jeff, you and I had this conversation. I have to wonder, remember last year you ran so many Euro NASCAR races, majority are at road courses. I wonder how that experience is going to help translate over to learning a new road course here at Indy. Oh, it's definitely going to help him. That Euro ex experience, running all different kind of road courses, and you talk about showing up at racetracks not having a clue what they were about, right? I mean, that was a, it was a big experience for him. You know, he had big goals for that year, and they changed, but he made the most of it and got a lot of lap time. See right here, Jeremy Clemens had some sort of issue. Let's see what happened to him. Just got into turn seven too far, too deep. Off into the grass. Sitting fifth on the chart right now, which is incredible because he has zero sim time, no engineer help, showed up really just blind as to what they needed and unloaded with a really quick race car. This team and driver do such a good job. That really is what this Xfinity Series is about. It Winner really in 2017 is. at a road course. Pretty incredible day for this young man and his team. Battling here with Matt Tim. And there was a little contact. He was so far ahead, though, that he gets his car right and going without losing the lead, goes on to win the race. Speaking of Indy. That's a spin and win, Danny Sullivan. You're very <laughs> impressed with impressed. that. This, this was an win. upset. Yeah. I mean, a huge upset. Well, it's a family team. I mean, it's a it's a team that the, the family has been involved with racing engines for a long time, uh, but not the number of employees that we see in, in the bigger companies, the bigger teams that come to the track every weekend. And so when Jeremy Clements can get to victory lane, that is a huge win for his family in that organization. You talk about a family, think about this. Jeremy's grandfather worked with Rex White. Yeah, Hall of Famer yeah. Rex White. Yeah, when the year he won a championship in NASCAR. So really a third generation racer. You know, it's also a win for NASCAR, in my opinion. The Xfinity Series should have that opportunity for family owned teams, smaller teams to compete with the big teams. That's that's the essence of this series, in my opinion, is those small teams being able to compete. You see right here, Justin Haley working hard on that pit road. We're going to see green flag stops tomorrow. There's no doubt in my mind about that. You have to maximize your opportunity when you're getting on that pit road. That's a long access road coming to pit road before pit road speed starts. So, Jeff, let's talk the whole thing. So, basically, the entrance of pit road is to driver's right, right here. So you come through this left-hander to stay on the track. You go to driver's right out there where it says register. This closest to you is the entry. Still no speed all the way down until you take that right-hand corner, which we just saw Haley do. This is a great shot coming straight at you into this right-hander. As we look left, we're going to see a yellow line. That's the speed line. Still, still, still. Look at all that time you could gain or lose. You hit that yellow line, then you're at speed, and then it doesn't get simpler. Then you run down a very narrow pit road in Indianapolis the wrong way. These pit crews that have already had to figure out how to train and organize through this pandemic, Rick, now they're going to have to pit the cars as they do at Watkins Glen and some other road courses where the driver is far away from pit wall, not closest to pit wall. It's a different sort of layout, a different sort of orchestration of the pit stop. Guys do different jobs. Then you have this long trip. You see down pit road. You see the yellow line is where pit road speed ends, but that's not the only line you care about. You then have to stay within that white line. So you just can't pop out onto the front stretch. You need to leave, stay under that white line all the way past the grass until you see that kind of crossways white line. Then welcome 
back to the racetrack. <laughs> That's a long time off the racetrack. So as a crew chief, I need to know how much time that takes so I don't lose laps of things. One more bit of information these crew chiefs don't know at a new track. And, Steve, that's one of the things that it, I think you're so good at. You see, and we call it delta, the, the time when you're how far you are away from the leader so that you know if you pit, you can still get out in front of them and not lose a lap. So what I would do right now is I would have my driver, if it's Jones right here in the 19, to run a lap on the racetrack, come down, run pit road, run all of pit road speed, and re-enter the racetrack. I can then use timing and scoring to figure out, okay, it took 35 seconds approximately. Then I add in a pit stop, figure out if I need fuel or tires. Then I roughly know how much time I need because, guys, why handling is important. Dale Jr., you know as well as anybody, guess what? The, what I'd rather have better than a fast race car, track position. If you can hit the strategy right and get track position, you'll have a chance. Yeah, I want you to be able if I got good speed in my car, I want you to bring me down a pit road and get me on the racetrack by myself without traffic so I can make up some great time. So Ross Chastain also with another patriotic paint scheme. Oh, let's listen into his radio. That helps a lot. The driver needs help with not trying to get too much in all the corners and all over the track, but I say you're making big gains. That was good. It's hard. It's completely, completely different from oval racing, for sure. Different mindset completely. So just think of it. Set yourself up for the next corner is the biggest thing, first principle. Talked about how hard it is, and I think what's what looks difficult to me about this racetrack is the variant speed. So some of these corners are so slow. If you push too hard, you're actually going to hurt your car as far as the speed. And then there's other parts of the track like this that there's a lot of speed, and I think that variant speed and understanding where you're trying to push and where you shouldn't be pushing, that's going to determine who can make the best lap time, Marty. And Jeff, the other interesting thing, he said the driver needs help. So who is he waiting on on the track there? That's right, his buddy and teammate, A.J. Allmendinger, waiting for him to catch up so he can learn a little bit more. Junior, I like what they're doing here. Ross saying, hey, I'm not the best at this. I'll take whatever help I can get. It's allowed Ross to knock about seven tenths off of his fast lap time compared to practice one. So he is learning. A lot of these guys really picking up a lot of time, being able to in practice one, sit down, think about what they're doing, go back out on the racetrack. Harrison Burton in fifth place right now. Big gains between practice one and practice two. Whole field's going to see a lot of that. Who's going to do that the most? Who's going to be able to make the most out of these two practices today? Well, I'm going to challenge these drivers to try to help me understand as we see the lead and follow continue with the call of cars. You know, why is it, in my opinion, it seems like the road course specialists, the guys with all the experience like A.J. Allmendinger, are just so good under braking, right? You know what I mean? They do change direction good. They hit their marks good. But the straight line braking, which is not just lap time, right? That's most important in the race. That's how you defend and pass. Junior, how do those road course guys get in a different vehicle and they're just so good in braking? Look, I'm no road course expert, but I've been around a few. And they understand that the best opportunity to slow the car down is when it has the most downforce, when it's going the fastest. So they try to do all of their braking initially. In the first initial pressure of the brake, they go really hard on the brake pedal because that's when the car is going the fastest with the most air on the car, pushing the tire into the ground. Race car drivers that run ovals, they brake very easily and trail brake down into the center of the corner. So if you apply that sort of technique, you're really going to end up going too quickly into the center corner, drag the, drag the tires, or miss the corner entirely. So when you go to a road course, you really got to attack the brake pedal. You got to go deeper into the braking zone, brake later, but much, much harder than you really imagine you, you do on an oval. So, you know, the 16th car going into turn seven, but traditionally, you know, these guys are learning as, as you go out on the racetrack as an oval race car driver, seeing this place for the first time, you're going to start braking way too early. Try to challenge yourself to get deeper into the braking zone, but apply more pressure to the brakes. What, what, what the difference in that, though, is the ability to get the car stopped with that wheel hop. And we've shown several drivers trying to drive into the corner deeper, and they get that wheel hop, and then they lose control, and now their lap time's completely done, or they're wrecked. A.J. Allmendinger, Austin Sendrick, those guys, they have a way of working their feet, when they're on the brakes, when they're off the gas, how far they get in there, all those things to keep those rear tires from locking up. And, and 
that is where you pass. That's where you make lap time. It's amazing how much lap time you can make by driving in the corner deeper and being able to still make the corner. And road course drivers, they just can do it better. That they're just so much better at that skill. And and I never figured it out. I never understood how you know it's got brake pedal and a gas pedal. How difficult is it? But I never could carry as much speed as, as some of those guys could that were better road racers than me. Alma Digger coming back into the garage. Steve, yeah. you, you've worked with a lot of different drivers over the years. Um, you know, and you heard me talking about brake pressure. Uh, I always like to use the RPMs of the engine to slow, help me slow the car down as well. Really rev that thing up in the downshifts to help the car slow down in the corners. What are some of the techniques as the crew chief that you saw that worked the best? Well, to your point, I actually saw the road course drivers the opposite. They use a ton of braking to slow the car down. And I've actually seen some drivers use the clutch. When that wheel hop starts that you talk about, they actually are heel toe. They're using their right foot on the brake, their left foot's on the clutch. And by, you know, engaging the clutch, disengaging the engine, they can actually use more braking force without upsetting the race car. It's very, very different. It's funny you say that. I think that's what made a driver like Jeff Gordon so impressive is he was so good at that light trail break at a place like Richmond and Martinsville where he had such good control of his car, yet he could go to Sonoma and Watkins Glen and in an instant flip his mind to a completely different way of attacking a corner. That's what impressed me so much about Jeff is that he could drive how the racetrack needed to be driven, not be stubborn with what his style had to be. The other thing that a good road racer like Justin Algar is they know what the car is supposed to feel like. Right. Right. And I know that sounds silly, but when I was road racing, I never really, when I make a good lap time, I didn't really know why. You know what I mean? And, and, and so these guys, they feel their car. They know where that limit is and that feel of the car so you can relay that information to the team. No one's driving a car today or tomorrow that's perfect. Every car can be improved. But if the driver can't understand where it needs to be better, then how can the team make it better? And that feeling of the car is something that road racers have that guys that are not as good just simply don't. And Austin Cindric definitely falls into the category of great road course racers. And right now, second on the practice sheets. I think one of the big things Austin Cindric would really like to do is give Roger Penske another win at Indianapolis Motor Speedway, maybe even on the road course. The captain right here at this historic racetrack has so much success. 18 Indy 500 championships between 13 drivers, five straight IndyCar Series wins at the road course, which we'll see them running tomorrow. Brickyard 400 win, that was the first time in the Cup Series he had got the Brickyard win back in 2018. Xfinity Stories race held here at IMS, Brad Kozlowski won that in 2012. And of course, it was earlier this year that the handshake and the deal was done. Roger Penske acquired IMS and IndyCar January 6, 2020. Kelly. And Rick, ask any Team Penske driver in any series, they'll tell you there's always added pressure and emphasis to win here at Indy. And that was before Roger Penske but the Speedway. Uh, Austin Sindrick made an interesting point earlier this week when talking about this race. He said there's extra meaning because of the uncertainty of the Xfinity schedule beyond this month. He said all four series road courses last year were held after July and NASCAR has not yet announced the Xfinity schedule. He said it's no secret that we have a strong road course program. So it sounds like there's a little bit of a sense of urgency to get a win here, kind of not knowing what the schedule uh, lies ahead for them and how many more road courses they'll be able to take advantage of. That is a great point. I mean, with the uncertainty of the schedule and, and Austin Cindric being so good on road courses, that puts a lot of pressure on him. We just talked about the burden that A.J. Allmendinger had with the pressure of running the cup cars on road courses because he was so good. You know, Austin Cindric can't take all that pressure, right, and put that on him about this one race because that can be overwhelming. But that is a great point I've not considered. They just went to the top of the board. First car in the 129 second bracket today. We're watching Chase Briscoe go around the racetrack and follow him with our track map. Chase okay. is making his first lap on the, on the track uh, for this practice. We're seeing fastest laps at lap five for both Cindric and Almendinger. Does that mean not a lot of fall off on the tires? I imagine it's a pretty tough tire for this track. Not wanting to come here with too soft a tire. It's going to get these guys problems. 
bad, or I'm not sure if they put new tires on. That's a great question. I don't have the answer to. Briscoe currently fourth and really the hottest driver right now in the Xfinity Series. Four wins already on this short season. Jeff talked about the pressure on Cindric. I think there's pressure on Briscoe. You know, an Indiana driver racing at Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Talks about watching Tony Stewart winning the Brickyard 400. Told us he's been in the simulation every Wednesday since February running this racetrack. While I love the commitment, Jeff, I have a little concern about, you know, does it become too much pressure? Do you make it too much of an important event? Yeah, I, you know, with Chase, he's so laid back. You know what I mean? I just, and he's dealt with pressure. This guy races for his life every year. You know, he, he, year to year, he doesn't know what his situation is. And it wasn't until January this year that he knew he had a full-time ride. He doesn't know what he has going on for next year. I think this guy, I, I, you guys know what I, I think he is. He has a great future ahead of him, I believe. I think he's built to handle the pressure. Just calm, cool, collected. I put my, you know, I don't think he's going to have the speed that Cindric and Almendinger have, but I love his racecraft. 2018 Rogel winner it was really impressive during that during that race to Rogel. Hiking up that tire a little bit, pulling that left front off the ground. Chase Briscoe has had a. I would say as, as up and down a season as any, and I wouldn't even call it a race car driver, I'd say as any person could have, because Chase Briscoe, a race car driver, uh, his highs obviously come at the racetrack, but he and his wife had one of the lowest lows you can have. They lost a baby uh, just before a race, and Chase was able to go to that very next race and win, and even though the win felt great, obviously beating one of the best, the best all time in the Xfinity series in Kyle Busch. There were tears in his eyes because he knew how big of a moment it was and what he had been through. Back at the end of May at Darlington. The emotions overcoming him. Wife Marissa again losing a baby, and so it was a big win for Chase Briscoe. It was a time when the families couldn't be together because of the pandemic, and so that was another difficult situation that Chase Briscoe had to battle through. He's put the number of eight out there for himself as far as. He thinks that eight wins could get him to the next level. And the Xfinity Series is where names are made. Chase Briscoe was a competitor in the Xfinity Series a year ago. Uh, really was in the shadow of the big three last year. And now has jumped out of the shadow and really is the shining spot right now for the Xfinity Series with the four wins. But he thinks it's going to take eight to get to the to the cup level. I've never heard that before. I've never heard a driver say, you know what, I need to go out here and win eight races this year to get a job for next year. We, he knows that he doesn't know what his plans are. Um, and we've seen drivers in that situation before. We have drivers in the series this year in that situation. But nobody's came out and said, I think if I win eight races, that might get me a new job. Um, I think that's incredible uh, that he's put that number out there. I think a lot of people were pulling for him to succeed. Mike Wallace steps out a little bit here. All right, here's your test right here, Steve. You've been worried about this gravel, this the sand traps. I have, you know, when cars go into them at other facilities, we've seen where they've got stuck. Mike Wallace, he's he has, powered down. Yeah, he's got his Baja moment. Seems <laughs> to be doing pretty good to get through it. That's the trick. Once you're in it, you should got to stay in the gas, keep the car moving. If the car gets slowed down at all, it's going to get stuck. It doesn't look too, too terribly deep, though, does it? It, it looks like, you know, Remember the ones at Watkins Glen? Yeah. The thing would sink up to about halfway through the door, it seemed like. It doesn't look too, too thick. So maybe they won't get stuck. Yeah, at the Glen, you'd have rocks in the headers. Yeah. <laughs> but it uh, looks pretty decent here. Guys will be able to navigate through that, I believe. As long as they don't go in there sideways. Yeah, that's the problem. On the race, they usually go in there backwards. <laughs> We're glad you're joining us here on Track Pass today. 
catch the action from NASCAR and IMSA, American Flat Track, and more with Track Pass on NBC Sports Gold. You don't want to miss the Green Flag Live, commercial free, and of course on demand. Learn more at NBCSports.com slash Track Pass. And a big weekend here on Track Pass. Big weekend on Track Pass, all the different stuff. We have ARCA just down the street, Lucas Oil Raceway. We talked about Indianapolis. The big track has everything. Well, the whole town has everything. Guys, we talked about an Indy car. So right here, this got my attention. This left-hander as the cars are coming at you. Look at the black streaks of rubber that the Xfinity cars are putting down. Normally, no big deal. That's it, man. That's grip. That's helping these Xfinity cars. But right after this practice is Indy car qualifying. One of the challenges of the two series that's always been under conversation is the difference in tires and the difference of how the track will be cleaned. I'm going to be fascinated to see what the track does to clean this area before IndyCar qualifying and see what kind of grip they have as they go through this Goodyear rubber that's been put on the racetrack. Oh, Michael and Nat backwards. I'm with you, Steve. I, you know, we we have uh, this happen quite a bit at New Hampshire when we have a lot of different series track run. Clear. When we track have a lot of different clear. series running in the same weekend, the Modifieds, the Bush North, or whatever it may be, Xfinity Cup, everybody on kind of a different tire. The, the track really changed dra drastically from practice to practice. Uh, this is a Firestone tire on the Indy car and a Goodyear tire, obviously, on the Xfinity cars. How are those going to react with each other? It's going to be tough for these series guys to figure out. Yeah, the Indy car, they qualify next. <laughs> you know, they just roll, go right, right, got to go roll right out and qualify. They are in for a, a bit of a surprise, I believe. Yeah, I think you're right. As to how their cars are going to grip on this Goodyear rubber. guys are talking about qualifying coming up next. That's on NBCSN, followed by Dale Jr. Download. Paul Morris is the guest. Mike Lynette, it just, they kind of struck magic in 2019. Travis Mack and he, they had a great year. Their performance in 2019, or 2020 is definitely down some. Their numbers just aren't there. And I, I don't really know why. I can't put my finger on it. I don't know if it was the win. Remember a year ago, he wanted the season over at Daytona. That can take the pressure off. Dale Jr., you and I experienced that. And I think we had one of our best years knowing we were in the playoffs. We got to relax. I don't know if that's what has, has affected the one car, but I'm looking for something, a spark, something to fall their way. Maybe last week, you know, their best run of the year was last week at Pocono, a fifth place finish. See if they can maybe make that the spark carried over to Indianapolis. Their success depends on the relationship between the driver and the crew chief, not just on the race weekends, during the week. They work out together, they hang out together. When they're doing a lot of that, can hold each other accountable, talking about their race weekends, they have success. Junior, you are a busy man. We just saw that, obviously, you have Paul Morris on the Dale Jr. download coming up here. Uh, a little bit later on this evening, but on July 15th on Peacock, it's Lost Speedways. That's when it will premiere. You've been very busy with that. Yeah, Lost Speedways is a passion of mine. Uh, this is a TV show about old abandoned racetracks, and we go, and I say we, me and Matthew Dillner, who you saw on the TV there, me and him both have a big passion for this, and we go looking for these racetracks. We go find them, and we also learn about what the racetracks meant to those communities, meant to the drivers who race there, it's going to be a great show. I think people are going to love it. I've been wanting to do this for several years, so finally glad to be able to uh, let you guys see this. July 15th, Peacock, the new streaming platform for NBC. Go download the app. You're going to enjoy this show. Lost Speedways. You've told us a little bit about some of these tracks, and I can't wait to see this. I mean, you, you've mentioned where you'll walk into what looks like just a bunch of trees, and all of a sudden you'll see a pole yeah. that'll be up there that used to, say, hold a light or used to hold the, the speaker I'm or really, from that track. Yeah, I'm really proud of this because Dirty Mo Media, my, my, my company, has, has created this show, uh, the same company that's been doing the podcast for years. And it is that's the that's the selfish part for me is is being able to go put boots on the ground and see these racetracks for myself and see the evidence of the track in in the in the space we're in. But we also learn so much about the the, the histories of the track, the drivers, the community, and everything else. There's no one that I'm aware of that cares more about the history of the sport than you do. It's like you, you put a ton of effort into that. Remind everybody where this sport started. Touts race one. Everybody's still playing nice together in the booth, Rick. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it, it won't take long. Don't worry. Watching Justin Haley go around the racetrack. Third on the board. He's got some great talent as a road racer. Definitely feeding off of, of his teammate, Almendinger, what, the, what he brings to the whole program. 
He's got a shot to sneak in there and be part of that conversation tomorrow. And a crazy story for Justin Haley. I mean, he's got a win already this year. It was at Talladega. But Justin Haley actually got a win in the Cup Series. And it was during the July race when it rained out. We had lightning and rain, and it shortened the race, and it just so happened that he was out front when they called the race. You know, he'd like, he'd like to get an official or, or a win by going out there and beating all those guys, but I'd take that too. Yeah. I'd, I'd take a win any way you get it. Talk about the speed of this track. He was he ran through that first section all the way in first gear. That's how much slower it is. You don't see many racetracks where you run first gear. He's in second right now, up to third. Now down this back straightaway. We'll see if he pulls fourth. Gonna have to pull fourth. Now probably all the way back down to second. All the way to first. This is this, this is like homework for me. I was, I was trying to picture the ratios in my mind. This is helping me out. Yeah, still for, for ran first all the way through that whole section. See the temperature inside the car there, 113. That's, uh, you know, 113's not comfortable, but we've seen a lot hotter in the interior of these cars. These road courses get a lot of brake temperature coming back through that firewall into the interior of the car. As they get it deep into these runs midway through this race, you're going to see that temperature of the interior being a lot hotter. Let's hear the radio from the 11 car. I would say that's about half better. I mean, I think the tires are just getting used up at this point. I'd like to read baseline and just see right there. Um, front turns okay. Just, uh, you know, I'm just sliding around. It's hot, greasy out here. These tires got a good amount of laps on them, good amount of heat cycles. Heat cycles. That's the in and out. Oh, Justin Algar off track here in turn seven. So this is interesting because look at the cone. Where, where'd that cone come from? It's all right. Way over on the other <laughs> side of the track. I, I was wondering. We had a rogue cone. I don't think it got there on its own. Where How the did, turtles yeah. are going to be. <laughs> Let's see what happened. Let's see how the cone. I think the cone came from over there on the right. Oh, it's already there. It's already there. Yeah. It's Justin just, yeah, just wheel hopping. Maybe he was distracted by the cone. Yeah. <laughs> More wheel hop issues there. And Steve, there's things that you can do to set up the car too to help that wheel hopping. It's you know the driver can change what he's doing in the braking zone. But what can you do to the car to help that wheel hopping for me? Well, you showed cars earlier with the front tires hiking. Why you would think the rear springs, the rear suspension should only affect maybe the cornering. It can absolutely affect the ability of the car to control those rear tires under braking. How stiff or soft the rear springs are, the angle of the rear suspension, the truck arms. There's so many different things. Brake bias, which can be controlled inside the car. Shock absorbers are a gigantic thing. One of the biggest developments we did in shocks in the road courses was to try to control those rear tires. And as we see the cone, it was actually Mike Lynette, Justin Allgaier's teammate, that so I think right there, he actually was catching the 78. I'm going to applaud Mike Lynette right there, understanding the bailout, right? Yeah. So he was catching the 78 in a bad spot, Jeff. And while it looks silly to spin through the cones, it looks way sillier to run the 78 over and damage your race car. Yeah. How about these two? This is going to be interesting. Chase Briscoe, Harrison Burton. Briscoe in the 98, Harrison Burton in the 20. Yeah, I think what this is, is Harrison trying to learn from Chase Briscoe. Harrison does not have as much experience. Not had a lot of success on road courses, and Chase Briscoe has. So roll in behind him, see what you can learn. Just listen to what Chase Briscoe is talking about. Right on the right handers a little bit, and then edgy in the back. You just need something to, you need lateral, you think, to tie it together? I think so. I mean, it's right in the dead center of the corner is where I lose my lateral. And then after that, I can't, I, you know, I can't put any wheel in it because I'm, I'm on the verge of getting sideways, so then I'm tight the front end on exit. Like if we fix the, the lateral, then that'll help my front. All right, so lateral. Here's the two things. The, the tire grips in kind of two directions. One, like you step on the throttle and tire spins. That's tire spin, forward drive. We talk about that, you can feel that in your car at home. That's pretty easy to understand. What the fan at home has a hard time getting to, I hope, 
is the lateral grip of the driver or of the tire. That basically means you go down to the corner, and Dale Jr., you're leaning on a cane or a crutch, right? Lateral. It's pushing on the side of the car. Well, when that goes away, the car, the car slips sideways. It sounds to me like he goes down in there, he leans, 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 and the back tires step out sideways, and now he's done, right? Now he's corrected with the steering wheel, he's off the bottom of the corner. That would be concerning to me. That would be probably the first thing. If I fix that, you're going to have to fix the drive off. Yeah, lateral grip, you're wanting that everywhere you go, whether you're at a road course. Oh, Almendinger having one rear off track. But I mean, you know, lateral grip is something you're searching for in a race car. I don't care what racetrack you're at. And if a crew chief can give you some, he's he's a miracle worker. <laughs> Here's AJ in the seven. This seven. Being a tough corner for these guys. Interesting off. There was something he did. So it all started at the entrance of the corner. He just was trying to carry it was carrying yeah. too much speed. It ended up listen in the grass it. after the corner. Yeah, let's listen. Yeah, no, no wheel hop, just too much speed. Couldn't make the corner. He knocks it out of gear and coasts on through there. Good bailout zone though. I tell you the guys, I really like that about this racetrack. We've seen many cars go off, but no damage, no splitter damage, no damage at all. One thing though, Rick, guess what happens for every car that goes off the racetrack? Good job for the day, guys. Good job. We're done for the day. It has to come back on somewhere. So today it's great because it's practice, but let me tell you, tomorrow in the race, when that guy shoots off there through the grass, he has to find his way back on the pavement in traffic. Does that promote more aggressive driving when guys think, well, you know what, I can miss this corner and it's not going to do any damage to my car? What I saw last week, I don't think they're going to have to promote aggressive driving. <laughs> it's already there. <laughs> yeah, we, we've always found the grass on the grill to be a real big issue with these guys when they run the oval. It's going to be a problem, too, tomorrow. You go off the racetrack, or, but there is no runoff or, or sand traps. It's all grass. You're going to get that grass on your grill. The grill of the cars behind you can potentially pick up some of that grass as well. Here we go. We're going to ride along with Justin Haley. This is the back straightaway. This is where we just saw A.J. Allmendinger have that problem. See Justin Haley carrying as much speed as he can. Now a quick change of direction, a 90-degree corner. Trying to get the rear wheels hooked up. Look at this little series of corners all the way down in first gear. Really slow. Look how slow this is. You know, people think it's slow. That means it must be easy. The slower it is, the harder it is. There's a reason it's slow. Now he's going to turn, and this part of the racetrack is so critical. It's a great opportunity right here to make up a lot of speed. It's also an opportunity to drag that right front, slide that right front. Justin doing a nice job looking for this curb. Where do you want to be at this curb? Right there at the very end of it. Here he comes to the front straightaway. Around turn 14 here. Trying to get the power down, trying to get it down. More, more throttle, more throttle out onto the front straightaway here. Long front straightaway by the pits. All the teams watching you go by. Hoping you pick up a few spots into the big braking zone into turn one. And that's early. It's way earlier than I would have expected. Slow, slow turn one here. Now back the other direction. A couple left. A couple rights. We're going to go to turn here. This is turn four and five and six, I think, real critical. Get this right so you can carry the speed down this long straightaway. Junior, that is a lap 11 of a run. So you're seeing, you're seeing a run. That's tire wear. That lap right there was at 132. I'm sorry, 133.90. His fastest lap is a 130.70. So we are going to see some tire fall off. Here's Alex LeBay. Oh. 2017 Pitti Series champion up in Canada. Alex is from Quebec. Running well, though, guys. I mean, he's upside up there in the top 10, ninth quick so far. We've seen this out of this car at the road course. Those, those uh, Pitti Series races, they are aggressive. They get after it. Good road racers. Alex is 15th in points, 36 points out, off the bubble for the playoffs. So this is an opportunity for him. His team knows it. Gain some points on those guys and put himself in a better position. As we get closer and closer to the playoffs, guys are looking at those points now. Jeff, you mentioned that tire fall off. It's th this race just has the makings of everything you're looking for. Tires are going to slow down quicker than the fuel burns off. Can you stay out on old tires with track position? Do you need to come in and put tires on? 
and keep the fuel short. And there's so many opportunities from on top of the pit box. And I really think it's important to match that with your driver. Someone like Alex here has a lot of road course experience. He may be okay out front on old tires. Dale, you and I are best success on the road courses. You told me I like to be aggressive. Don't make me block. Don't let me run in my mirror. I want to run out the front window. That's how we were the most successful. Not because it was right for our car, but it was right for what we were trying to do. That's going to be, I think, most important when you look at all these different drivers, someone like Alex or even Harrison in the 20. Yeah, Alex is a guy that, that I would feel so confident in if he was driving my car because this is a new track. A lot of young guys out here. A lot of guys with not a lot of time even on sim for this racetrack. And he finished sixth at the Roval last year being steady and smooth and not making mistakes. He's got another great opportunity this weekend to do the same thing. These guys around him are going to make so many mistakes during this race. It could take them out of position. If he can just survive and keep that thing going straight on the blacktop, he's got a great opportunity to top 10, maybe even a top five. Two and seconds, they slowed down. Yeah, that ends the practices that the Xfinity Series has on the road course here at Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Guys finishing their laps up. The names that we thought would be up toward the top are there. Sendrick, Almendinger, Haley, Briscoe, Allgaier, Ross Chastain, Noah Gregson, Harrison Burton, Alex LeBay, and Jeremy Clements all inside the top 10 in this second practice of the day. See these two guys working on getting on pit road. We talked about how important that's going to be. And look at that, though, Jeff. Not important, but it, it didn't strike me till right there how single file it is. So now you think about green flag pit stops, you could be doing great, Rick. But if you get on that access road and the guy in front of you is lollygagging, it's going to cost you time. Okay, I asked it after the first quest, or the first practice, but I want to pose it again to you guys. After two practices now, and Junior, you can't just read the names off the top of the list <laughs> again like you did last I mean, time. Who do you think is going to be the favorite for tomorrow's race? Well, I, you know, I think Almendinger or Cindric, whoever gets the lead between those two cars. Well, that's pretty obvious. The whoever guy who has the lead is going to win. <laughs> Look, there's no secrets here. I okay. think it's obvious to everybody watching. Cindric and Almendinger are much better than the rest of the field. Now, they're, they're pretty even as this as these two practices have went on. Almendinger's closed the gap on Cindric. Cindric came out in practice one, laid down a lap, number one on his first lap of the race, but Almendinger's closed the gap. I believe if you put him out in front of Cindric late in that race, he drives away. Not only holds on to the win, but drives away. So I'm going with the tortoise and the hare approach as we see the captain, Roger Penske, up here. Checking things in out. The sights. I agree, Cindric and Almendinger have the raw speed, but I'm actually looking at Briscoe in the 98 and Allgaier in the 7. They both made longer runs. I think they're both in control. And I think there's not the pressure to win because they don't have the fastest cars, right? Everybody tonight is going to be talking about Cindric and Almendinger. So can those other guys maybe stay off the radar a little bit and just have a good solid day? Mistakes, right? This will come down to who doesn't make mistakes and strategy. We've seen so many times on road courses, we're talking about the drivers. What about the crew chiefs? What crew chief's going to make the right call to put his driver in the right position? Bringing in the crew chiefs. I like that. Oh, we sharing the blame, Rick, sharing the blame. A great crossover weekend here at Indianapolis Motor Speedway. And coming up next on NBCSN, it's IndyCar Series Grand Prix qualifying. Will Power always good at trying to get the pull. And then, of course, Dale Jr. download with Paul Morris at 6.